This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. Stand by, 15 seconds to air. Stand by, all cameras and video tape. Ready with your opening graphics. Stand by, Howard. Here we come, Frank. Ready, Don. Stand by, audio. Your opening music and roll tape. Take tape. tape. Jumping, I'm hearing them. You know what? I remember in the 90s, NFL Films did uh, some kind of computer game, and somehow somebody beat us. So I had to promptly uh, put that to rhyme. It says, so you challenged my record with the computer scheme, using NFL Films to make a field of dreams. Our parking spot is in front of everybody's record book. If your memory's hazy, go back and take another look at the stats that we posted when we made the climb. It's up to 40 damn years, and we're still around. It's not a secret how we did it. The equation's the same. You want to go undefeated, you got to win every game. I know you wonder. I haven't been at one place with Mercury where I haven't heard that song, okay? I say you have. <laughs> yeah. This is the wrong place, because he's scaring the fish away. <laughs> You're going to be a football player when you do that. Today is the best day of your life. We believe it. He might be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. He needs to be like that. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. The rest of your life, nobody could ever tell you that you couldn't do it. Three hundred and ninety one miles northwest of Anchorage, Alaska, on the shore of Norton Sound of the Bering Sea, lies the village of Uniclete. To the east is the Uniclete River, a body of water revered by anglers for its natural beauty and abundant salmon. For Hall of Fame fullback Larry Zonka, Alaska is home. An avid outdoorsman, the Alaskan wilderness has appealed to Zonka ever since he was a little boy. Grew up on a little farm out in the uh, farm area of Ohio, south of Cleveland, east of Akron. I loved to hunt and fish. I think I was eight years old. Mom went to the grocery store and she bought an outdoor magazine with a picture of a Kodiak bear with a big salmon in a stream. And I was mesmerized. I sat right there and read the entire story about Alaska. And I thought, someday, somehow, some way, I'm going to go to Alaska and enjoy that. So there was a competition in my life between Alaska and football always. I'd be down at practice, and it would be 95 or above. Shula, while he's teaching the rookies, he'd be looking at the vets in the back trying to make eye contact to see who was in a glazed, faraway place. And of course, there I was. I'm in another world completely. And all of a sudden, I'd hear, Zonka! And he'd be right beside me. And I'd jump and look at him, and he'd say, where are you? You're not here. And I never told him. After 40-some years, ladies and gentlemen, and Coach Shula, this is where I was. It, uh, 
don't get any better. All right, big boy. We'll have him succumb to our superior will. You know, it's been 40 years since Jim and Merck and I were in the same backfield. I've been barking at him for the last 15 years, for sure, to come up and go fishing. We're getting to the age where we might not get a chance. And finally, I've got him up here, and I mean to get him a fish. Now, the only problem I had with all that is neither one of them fish. That's a nice big buck. He doesn't like the looks of that net. had a choice being in an NFL camp or catching this fish what would you want to do I don't hunt and fish I go to pool halls Alaska's a long way I don't have <laughs> I'm not gonna go up there too many times. This is probably my first and last time I'll ever go to Alaska. Me and Kick are schlepping up there, and I'm looking at this, and you know, we gotta go from Miami all the way across what you call your United States of America there, and then we gotta go from what you call your Northwest Passage there all the way up to what you call Anchorage. And then in Anchorage, you gotta take some kind of plane that ain't got but one engine on it and fly over to some place called Uniclete, which 1,100 miles down south of that is Hawaii. <laughs> so, you're asking me, how does it feel? I'll let you know after this 26-hour jolt. <laughs> at the end of the runway at the Uniclete airfield is a graveyard. Although the trip is as grueling as Morris and Kick anticipated, there's no need to inscribe the tombstones just yet. Holy mackerel! Holy God. Freezing my ass off. Welcome to Uniclete. Uh, we'll get you in the room, get you dry it out. Uh, he's been complaining a whole freaking John time. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Uncle. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, holy mackerel. Okay, you guys got this up here, Jim. One more look. <laughs> How was the boat ride over, Jim? Did you like it? The only thing that kept me warm was Mercury's hot air, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but how would you know it? You were crouched in a position holding on for dear life. <laughs> this is Jim Kick. Thank you, recognize him. There he is right there. We have a good relationship. It's like we never left. Glad to see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, P-10's the most basic dive we had. I loved it. I used to feel really fast on turf. <laughs> what so the hell does Mercury feel like that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's no fishtail. More than 40 years ago, these three Miami Dolphins formed the best backfield in the NFL.
Now, when you flip forward, you turn loose with your finger and it'll cast, see? Open your bail. Is it open now? Nope. I don't think so. See, it's clicked over there. See how the line runs oh, over there? Yeah, you click right. it like this, now oh, okay. throw it. Gotcha. You start to turn it and Whoops. bring it in. Good. Hey, watch it. Hey, you can tell I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> Jim Chunk, do that on purpose. <laughs> Never seen fishing poles turn into weapons so fast. <laughs> How did we get all of our lines tied? Yeah, this well, is like life here. Everybody stop reeling. As fishermen, the trio is a jumbled mess. As football players, they blended their talents perfectly. The running backs are just a, a joy every time I think about them. You have to start with Larry Zonka, who's as good as any fullback in professional football. Big and strong, he's in there every play of every ball game, giving you whatever he has. P-10 is the most basic straight dive we had. You took the ball and ran straight ahead, like Bronco Nagurski. We're going to score, or somebody's going to have to kill me. I loved it. Living out in the country, I think you grew up a little tougher. I think that childhood lent itself towards the NFL. First day of school, my mother sent flowers with me into my first grade teacher. I take two steps onto the school bus, and there's three boys sitting on a bus seat. Look at me and go, what's your name? I see Larry, and they said, oh, Larry the Fairy, because of the flowers, see? So I said, yeah, and I stuck him right in his face. Well, when I stuck him in his face, that was the last punch I landed until fifth grade. And I just got the living hell kicked out of me every day. One summer, I grew almost three inches and put on 33 pounds, and everybody that ever laid a hand on me, I thumped, particularly those three guys. I tried to drown them in the toilet. You know, I threw them off the end of the bus. <laughs> I became the bully. Uh, his running mate, Jim Kick, certainly does what you have to do to supplement what Zonka has. He can block for Zonka when Zonka's carried a ball. He used to go to school. I said, Coach, I said, why is a guy that's weighing 215, me, blocking for a guy that weighs 250 pounds? I could never quite understand that. But you were motivated because you knew I was coming behind <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah, this is true. <laughs> Kick was Jersey tough, like Zonka. He knew how to rumble. He's like Muhammad Ali in tight. You don't want to be in there. Kick is going to clean your clock. You didn't see big guys making the kind of moves and having the kind of footwork that Jim had. He's a strong guy that's also a real threat coming out of the backfield, catching the football. It was no coincidence that Kick's versatile style drew comparisons to Frank Gifford. I grew up a giant fan, and uh, he's the guy that I turned to that uh, I idolized. Always thought he was great, how he did everything. I was interviewed by him a few times and mentioned that he was my idol. And, you know, it was sort of pretty neat to talk to him. These two, along with Mercury Morris, give us three of the fine backs in professional football. Merck is the guy that can go into the ball game and get you moving if you're not moving. I started out in a kid's backyard playing touch football. And I never abandoned the principle from the time I came to the pros. If they can't touch you, they can't tackle you. Morris was so elusive and quick, he earned the nickname Mercury while playing his college ball at West Texas State. It stuck when Life Magazine came down in 1968. They took 4,000 pictures to get four. And they were there for seven days. They put the wings on the helmet and the wings on the shoes, and they had me standing up on a buffalo like Superman stands on top of the world. I was scared to death up there because I don't like heights. I used to think, wow, I feel really fast on this turf. I go, well, what so the hell does Mercury feel like then? You, know? <laughs> you want to cheat everybody into the inside to stop me from getting the first down? Because if you do, and we flip that ball to Merc, you're going to see nothing but his ass in passing you with both chrome pipes smoking. He's gone. And he'll come back and tell you about it after he does it. Too. <laughs> there was always a, a, a need for me to have to prove that I'm capable of doing what someone says that I might not be capable of doing. O.J. Simpson and I vied for the national rushing title two years in a row. In my junior year, when he beat me out, he sent me his freaking autograph. I was so mad. Uh, 
I broke into football kind of early. Some of my buddies talked me into going out for the seventh grade team. I didn't know a defensive end from a safety. Went out there and became like a tackling dummy for the eighth and ninth grade team. So I quit. And I'd have probably never gone out for football again, except, uh, you know, my principal, I got in a lot of trouble. And he got me down and said, listen, you need to take up a sport and vent some of this. You need to go out for football. I said, I went out for football, I'm no good at it. I told him what had happened, and he said, well, that's no way to judge it. And he taught me more in that office in six or eight meetings than I probably ever learned until I met up with Shula. And I went back out, and knowing where to line up and knowing what to do made a big difference, and I kind of turned a corner. That's a really super important move in my life. Turns out, Zonka isn't the only one who may have never been part of the perfect backfield. My grandfather, he was such a great influence in my life. I learned from him what it's supposed to be like if you stand up for yourself. I'm 67. He died when he was 67. When he died, I went down through the railroad tracks and uh, I, I, I screamed to God, why, why me, why him, why, why now? And I can remember that train coming by and me standing there. I contemplated ending my life in, in that one split second of insanity. He kind of said to me, are you a fool? Get your ass back home. And, and, and that's what I did. It's not tough. It's just reflective in terms of what, you know, what my life was. Larry Zonka and Jim Kick both arrived in Miami in 1968. Their combined talents helped transform the Dolphins, one of the AFL's weakest teams, into a Super Bowl contender. On the field, they are the best pair of running backs in the NFL. Off the field, they have one of the strongest friendships in professional sports. Friendship to me is very important, more important really than anything in my life. I once had a high school coach who told me that if you get out through life with one good friend, one really good friend, you're lucky. Well, I really consider myself very lucky. Friendship is really the most important thing in my life. We just had a personality that, uh, that sort of matched. We played football because we had fun playing it. We both enjoyed the nightlife. We both liked to have a good time. Zonka and Kick did everything together including hold out for a bigger contract during training camp in 1971. We were smart enough to know to show up to training camp in shape. But in order to work out, we had to dodge the press. All the reporters, they were getting phone calls from people saying, I saw Kick and Zonka, they're down at such and such park. By the time the media get there, we'd have left and gone somewhere else. Pretty soon, the kids that played at the parks would see us out there, and they'd recognize, they'd come out and start running with us, you know. And pretty soon, there's about 200 kids that are showing up at these parks and they're calling each other saying, hey, they're over here working out. We had a whole band of banshees running with us jogging, you know. And Bill Broucher called and we were telling him about that and he put it together with the Butch and Sundance thing. That's where it came from. Like we were wanted men, you know, people were looking for us. You know, I liked the movie. They were sort of two guys that were outlaws, but they were comical and they had a sense of humor, and Zonk and I always had a sense of humor, and we played on it a little bit. I can remember the hats and the horses. Collins Avenue. Yes, these guys are riding down Collins Avenue on horses. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid are alive and prospering in Miami, Florida. The guys who once hid from the media were suddenly everywhere, from magazines and books to television appearances. Butch Zonka and Sundance Kick were America's most wanted men. They've been called Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but they are some kind of football players. Would you welcome Larry Zonka and Jim Kick? <laughs> How do you get along with Don Shula? <laughs> You're trying to tell me something, Larry. Have you ever worked on a chain gang? 
whose personality fit yeah. Chula's? I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you might be the guy all the way at the end of the line. <laughs> when I was playing, I really didn't get along with him at, at all. I, mean, I couldn't stand when coaches yelled at me. I went the opposite way. I, I got lazy or, or had an attitude. I didn't like authority. It's the way I've always been. Sure, he used to have a 12-minute run. I was always the last guy because I thought it was stupid. I told him, Coach, if I wanted to growl for cross country, I would have went out in high school. And you had to shave. And then Jim cut that little slit right there. Yeah, right yeah, down that the made the difference. Yeah. That, yes. you know, so made, just so sure made, got that, you know, just, <laughs> just he had to have that little, you know. Larry seems to think I'm a troublemaker. Yeah. But Larry, like I said, is weird. <laughs> Zonka was a troublemaker, but he always blamed me. Manny Fernandez, I'm on fishing with him, and there's a bunch of baby gators up on the bank laying in the sun. Nasty little guys, about this big, you know, bite your finger off in a minute. And I said, yeah, I mean, too bad we can't get one. We, you know, I put it in Shula's locker. He said, I can catch one. And now he jumps out of the boat, goes up on the bank, and it's like King Kong in the reeds, you know. He's thrashing in there, and he comes out with this thing wriggling. He walks up and drops it in the boat. You know, I'm out the back of the boat. You know, I'm, I'm out in the water. So he put it in the trunk of that old Thunderbird I had, and that thing was banging around in there. And I'm trying to think, how can I get it in Shula's locker? And Manny Fernandez and uh, Coot staged a shouting match like they were going to get to fight in the office and Shula's secretary. While she ran over to them, I slipped behind her and went into Shula's office, went in there and put that thing in the shower, then I went out through the back door. The first guy he came to was you. Yeah, I got blamed for everything. You got blamed for everything. <laughs> he would tolerate a little more for the humor side from me because he knew that I would be serious about preparation. Zonk was his boy. I used to tell Shula all the time. No wonder he loves Zonk. You're both Hungarian, you're both from Ohio, and you're both ugly. And both of these guys think that I was his uh, son. You oh. know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I wish exactly. either one of you would have went in his office one time with me when he walked in there and said, now listen, you got something. He stuck that finger in my face, and I was like, listen, you, you know. How come I never ran into you? I was always in his office. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, I bowed to that. You, you were in there more than anybody else on the team. We were good friends before all this started. I'm sure that when football's all over with, we'll still get together, drink one or two too many beers, and uh, stay out one or two hours too late at night, still get in as much trouble as ever, but we'll still be very good friends. Next on A Football Life. Merck wanted to play all the time. I wanted to play all the time. All right, you're in for kick. That's when they wouldn't give me the ball anymore. Unless <laughs> no, was, they would. Unless it was on the one yard line. <laughs> What's wrong with having three guys? I mean, you never can have too many good running backs. I want to catch one before Jim. Well, you'll know when you get a hold of one. Uh, <laughs> they let you know. I, I just said that because I knew Jim would be looking over here at me. <laughs> I'm determined to catch a fish. Ah, this is cool. Take a hold of the reel. Take a hold of the pole. You got a reel. You got to keep your line tight. I got that now, son wait of a minute, bitch. Wait a minute. You ain't got him yet. He ain't in the net. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you got to hold that him. son of a Just no, pull it. <laughs> Calm down. OK. This is fun. Give me that net. <laughs> I got that son of a... Now you say you got that son of a... <laughs> <laughs> this is just another example of uh, my skills. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mo, come here. Now you got to take a hold of it like a minute, like a football, all right? Now, no, don't tell him that, Tonky. Fumble. Well, that made it all worth it right there, just that little moment. Yeah, well, just leave it here. Don't, when we get on a plane, I don't want to hear it from you all. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Now you're sure not to hear it because you said that. <laughs> OK, Jim, you're next. Don't worry about me. Worry about yourself. I'm not worried. <laughs> I just said, Jim, you're next. I want to you see know, you catch one. You know, 45 years I've been away from you two on a regular basis, yep. you know? Yep. And what happens is just like family, you remember 
all the good things and you think, man, I'm gonna get back around those guys. And then you get back yeah. around those guys and then you guys start that, no, I didn't, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's re a real family is right. that. Exactly. When you got that kind of thing, when you pick on each other, but just inside the deal, see? Yep, yep. Right. It's like Shula, it's our, Shula it's used to family. tell us all the time, we're a family, we can say anything to each other in here, <laughs> but you don't say it in front of anybody out there, That's you know, because it. it turns into a war zone. <laughs> For Mercury Morris, that lesson was learned firsthand after playing sparingly during the Dolphins' loss to Dallas in Super Bowl VI. After the game, I was upset because I'm thinking, okay, now, we just got our ass kicked, and I had nothing to do with it. So this reporter came up to me, and he said, well, uh, Mercury, is uh, anything wrong? I said, what do you mean, what's wrong? I said, the only time I was off the bench, except for the kickoffs, was the national anthem. So when Shula comes out of the bathroom, he says, if I find out you said anything, you've had it. I said, okay, fine. So then the next day, he calls me up, and he said, look, I got a cardinal rule. If you got a problem, then you come to me first. And if we can't rock, work that problem out, then you can go to the press. He says, well, I wanted to go with the guys that got us here. I said, coach, getting here isn't a thing. Winning when you get here is a thing. Morris came to the Dolphins as a third round pick in 1969 and had been used primarily as a kick returner. But that all changed in 1972. In the early going, Don did not have enough confidence in me to be able to fit into his system. There was a prototype of running back that Shula liked, and it was that Paul Horning and, and Jim Taylor prototype, and Zonk and Kick were exactly that. So we lose the Super Bowl. And then Shula says, what else can we do? What did Lombardi do? Stocked with similar talent, Shula decided to emulate Green Bay's one successful three-back rotation of Jim Taylor, Paul Hornig, and Elijah Pitts. And Elijah Pitts' number was 22. And I, and I can, right? yes sir. I remember him coming in for Horning, watching TV when I was a kid. Combination of kick and zonk is a good one, and I'm just going to try to get Mercury in the ball game as much as I can to, to get the speed in there. Running back, number 22, Mercury Morris. When Shula gave me that shot to play, that was going to interrupt that concept of Butch and Sundance. And in the beginning, Sometimes I would sit in between them just to sit there when it first started, just to kind of let them know that, like, this is how we're going to roll here. Uh, what, what yard line? All right, you're in for kick. But Shula's idea of platooning was difficult for Jim Kick to accept, at least initially. That's when they wouldn't give me the ball anymore. Unless, <laughs> no, they would unless it was on the one yard line. I had a hard time adjusting to it, really. Uh, I feel that I get stronger as, a, as I play more. Mark wanted to play all the time. I wanted to play all the time. But if I was content on not playing all the time, I don't think I'd be a ball player that I was. What's wrong with having three guys? I mean, you never can have too many good running backs. Oh, well, there's nothing wrong with it, Bob. Uh, well, they say that Chula has a problem. What's the What's the problem? Well, like he said, it's a good problem. The more good ball players you got, the better. You know, as much as it hurt me to not play as much as I had been, I knew we were probably better off as a team. And so whatever I could do to contribute to us winning football games, then uh, th that was fine. Well, I thought I had a pretty decent game. I thought Mercury did a real fine job, and I think it helped me with uh, him alternating. But uh, they always seem better when you win. The thing that I liked about the three of us, we never sat down and said, this is what we got to do this. We just said, hey, we don't give a rat. If it'll keep the old man off our back and we can win, we'll do it. When quarterback Bob Greasy broke his leg in week five, the threesome picked up the slack. Together, the trio helped power Miami's offense to a perfect 14-0 regular season record. Zonka and Morris became the first duo in NFL history to each rush for 1,000 yards, while Kick was a critical short yardage weapon, adding 10 touchdowns and nearly 800 yards from scrimmage. One of the greatest moments that I had of joy is when Jim scored that winning touchdown against Cleveland. Hands off, kick to the middle, and he got a I was so freaking happy that he did that. I ran out the field. I, I ran out the field. I'm going, Jim, yes! That was an eight-yard breakaway for me. <laughs> hey, but you ran through everybody doing it, man. 
Next, the undefeated Dolphins ran through the Steelers in the AFC Championship game, earning a return trip to the Super Bowl. And you know, everybody talks about, well, did you guys set out to be perfect? Yeah, we set out to be perfect. Did we believe we were gonna be perfect? No. What we wanted to do was have a championship season where we won it all. People look at us and say, hey, a bunch of old guys, you got you did one thing. We did one thing, we hit perfection. And when you become a definition rather than a, a number, then you're in a special place. The Dolphins have won Super Bowl VII and the greatest season in NFL history. Here's the perfect. <clears throat> we didn't try it, but it happened anyway. One game at a time. Next on A Football Life, a new league threatens to tear apart the perfect backfield. Jim and I and Paul went into a room and said, what do you think? The dirtiest look I ever got from Shula, and I got a lot of dirty looks from Shula. <laughs> he stood up in front of us in the beginning in 73. And we're at, a, we're at the strongest point. We just come off an undefeated season. I mean, what, you know, what's your encore? You know, what do you, and he said, our objective this year is to do it again, you know. And I, I looked right at him and said, uh, who's gonna break Greasy's leg? <laughs> <laughs> it pissed him off. <laughs> the Dolphins repeated as champions in 1973. Larry Zonka rushed for a Super Bowl record 145 yards and was named the game's most valuable player. The perfect backfield was at its zenith. Nothing could stop Miami. Nothing except for an offer from a new league. The World Football League comes along, and we sit down with the agent, and the agent says, would you guys entertain, you guys being me, Jim, and Paul Warfield, would you fellas entertain an offer from the World Football League if we could get all three of you to sign? When we went to see John Bassett up in Toronto, Canada, who was the guy that owned the team, instead of just talking, he lays the money on the table. It says, here's a couple million dollars for the three of you. And he said, it's on the table, but if you go back to Miami, it's off the table. So uh, Jim and I and Paul went into a room and said, what do you think? I threatened Zonka. I said, Zonka, you know, because if he doesn't go, then the deal's done. Fueling the trio's decision to leave was Dolphin owner Joe Robbie's frugal reputation. There was never a good rapport with anyone that was drafted in the top rounds, to my knowledge, with Joe Robbie. He was a hard guy to deal with. Like anything else, any other negotiations, Joe Robbie was sort of on the cheap end. We were making like $55,000 a year. We made more in playoff money than we did in salary. On March 31st, 1974, Zonka, Kick, and Warfield signed to play three years with the Memphis Southmen, beginning in 1975. The move would more than quadruple their NFL salaries. So when we jumped to the World Football League, I felt bad to leave Miami. But when they put money on the table, that changes how you're going to live the rest of your life. Now, the only thing, I, Shula wanted me to come back so we could talk to him. But I called him and told him, I can't. You know, it's on the table. And he said, well, you said you were going to come back here to talk to me. I said, I meant that, and I was going to. But it didn't work that way. They had gotten together and said, we're going to buy three of these to command the publicity, which will catapult the WFL into, you know, a recognizable name overnight. And it did. The departure of the three Miami stars immediately opened the eyes and the wallets of the NFL. Repercussions of us signing with the World Football League probably doubled most of the salaries in the NFL because the threat of the WFL at that time had to be taken serious. We know that did cause Robbie to actually want to renegotiate. You never heard Robbie say any renegotiation. This time, though, because of what you guys did, I went from making 55000 because we all made the same amount of money that then, to $135,000. That's, uh, that's when the price of football went up. But the Dolphin defectors were soon out of work when the WFL declared bankruptcy just 12 weeks into the 1975 season. 
suddenly I'm back on the market, but Joe Robbie says, I'm not going to talk to you without a written contract of what you want. Well, <laughs> when you're coming down to negotiate with somebody, you're not going to write down your lowest figure and send it to them. So I, we wrote down some figures that were kind of the figures that we used from when I played in WFL, and we sent it to him in, in good faith. And uh, he took it to the newspapers and ran it in the newspaper the next day. I was pretty hostile about that. I felt like I'd been set up. It all turned into newspapers and money at that point. A week later, Zonka signed with the Giants for the same terms he'd requested from Miami. But when Jim Kick sought a Butch and Sundance reunion in the Big Apple, he was quickly rejected by Bill Arnsbarger, Miami's former defensive coordinator turned head coach. Arnsbarger and I didn't get along really well anyway. and. Uh, he felt that I was bad influence on Zonka, and he didn't really want me to be there with, with Zonka, you know. So uh, that's why I ended up going to uh, Denver. 76, remember we all got together, right? we saw each other on the road. It was kind of crazy seeing us all together after all we had been through. And then the next thing I know, we're all in different uniforms, playing on different teams. When Denver and the Giants played. Yeah, because you came out there. You came I out came out. Coin flip. I promotioned at you and Floyd Little got you to go out there. Wasn't he the team captain? Too? Yeah. I saw him in the pregame world. I said, bring Kick out. <laughs> Besides the occasional coin flip, Kick rarely saw the field in his two years in Denver. It wasn't fun anymore. I just sort of lost uh, love of the game. I wasn't, I wasn't playing because I enjoyed it. So let me get out and retire while I'm healthy. Zonka and Kick's departure from Miami gave Mercury Morris the chance to become the Dolphins featured back. But injuries and clashes with Coach Shula were his undoing. In 76, I come back, and I'm ready to play. And I didn't play any of the exhibition the first five games. I didn't play. And I'm going, hey, if I'm going to get ready to play, i gotta, I got to play. And so the fifth game of the year, he calls me in the office. He says, listen, we're going to go another way this year. And so he cut me. Then six teams claimed me. When I was in the locker room, they said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Pittsburgh, Cleveland, or Oakland, any place but San Diego. And he sent me right to the Chargers. After just one year in San Diego, Morris opted out. I had had enough, and I quit. And there's a distinction. The guy said, well, I hate to see you retire. I said, I'm not retiring. I'm quitting. You retire when the game's had enough of you. You quit when you've had enough of the game. Back in New York, Larry Zonka was up to his old antics. The Giants and the Dolphins played an exhibition game my second year with the Giants. And I know the Dolphins' schedule. I mean, Shula doesn't change, you know. He always has his hamburger meeting at 9.30, just so he can count heads and see who's in the room. It's another deal to keep you herded in there on an away game. You know, I went through all that for seven or eight years, and I knew where they were staying. So I just went in, and Kuchenberg met me in the entranceway, him and Larry Little. <laughs> they took me down. And I was sitting in between them at the table looking at Shula having a hamburger. And he's up to make his announcement. He looks down and sees me. <laughs> it kind of rocked him back. I was in the team meeting with the Dolphins before the exhibition game the next day. It tickled a fire out of me. And then the next day on the field, I hooted at him a little bit a couple of times. Felt really strange to be on the other side of the field from the Dolphins. After three undistinguished seasons in New York, the Dolphins welcomed Zonka back in 1979. I gave retirement a great deal of thought to the last two years uh, with the Giants because they weren't using me at all. And uh, granted, I wanted to come back. Uh, this is home, and uh, I'm finally home again. Zonka picked up where he left off, leading the team in rushing. And his 3.8 yards per carry was the same average he had posted four years earlier. But as his role in the offense expanded, Zonka found the punishment harder to take. I ended up carrying the ball 25, 30 times a game. And I tell you what, I had some really bad Monday mornings and Tuesday mornings, let me tell you. At the end of the season, Zonka retired as the Dolphins' all-time leading rusher. Next on A Football Life. Now, I know that some people may be asking why we're doing this after all these years. The past meets the present during a make good White House visit. In 1972, we went undefeated, won the Super Bowl. 
but President Nixon had his hands full at the time. Right. <laughs> it seems to me there was a thing called Watergate going on. And uh, I think he was kind of a heavy Redskins fan, and after all, we did beat up his Redskins pretty badly. So we didn't get to go to the White House. Now, I know that some people may be asking why we're doing this after all these years. And my answer is simple. I wanted to be the young guy up here for once. <laughs> He was pretty cool, too. He talked. Yeah. He knew about sports, you yeah. know, and he knew about football. Is he really a sports fan? I believe oh, he's he got to be. Chicago, you know, well, he is. He's a Chicago he's Bear fan. A couple years ago, I hosted the 85 Bears. They had also missed their chance to have a White House visit. When he brought up the Bears, Shula mm -hmm. couldn't stand it anymore. Mm -hmm. You see the red come up on his neck, and I thought, well, here it goes. Bears lost once in their nearly perfect season. Beat it happened to be the Dolphins. <laughs> On December 2nd, 1985, Shula summoned his 1972 perfect team back to the Orange Bowl to help inspire the current squad against the previously unbeaten Bears. If there was ever a time that every second of every play had some resounding reverberations down through the decades, if there was ever a direct connection between two teams, it exists right now. Remember Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid back in 72? There they are, Jim Kick on the left, that's Larry Zonka on the right. We must have had like 20 or 30 players on the sideline, and I think the ghosts started to raise up a little bit, and uh, the Dolphins played an excellent game. It was exciting. It was like playing through someone else. Missing from the sidelines that night was Mercury Morris, who watched the game from his prison cell. An admitted recreational cocaine user, Morris was the target of a state drug trafficking sting in 1982. So history deems it, oh, Mercury Morris was selling coke. No, I wasn't. Mercury Morris tried to sell coke to undercover cop. No, I didn't. I got sentenced to 25 years because I knew a guy who knew a guy who had some coke. Morris's attorneys argued in his 1983 trial, and will argue again if necessary, that the former football star was entrapped. I was involved in, in the lifestyle, but it was the state that manufactured this simply because I was Mercury Morris. After serving three and a half years, Morris's case was overturned in 1986. The circumstances don't change the truth. I got myself into this and I hold no one responsible but me. Today, he is drug free and still working to clear his name. After football, Jim Kick returned to South Florida and worked as an investigator for Broward County's Public Defender's Office, retiring in 2012. For Larry Zonka, retirement has remained elusive. Through the course of my life, every time I've announced that I'm retiring, I get busier than I was before I announced I was retiring. And I'd like to tell you it's because I'm very talented and multifaceted and all that. Well, that's all horse I'm lucky. I was lucky when I got drafted with the Dolphins. And then Chulu comes and we win and people are buying me drinks, buying me dinner. Ah, beautiful women walk up and ask for my autograph. Suddenly there's a new league comes along. I offer you several million dollars laying on the table. Me and Kick and Warfield looked at each other and said, damn, you know, we're lucky again. I get out of football, I retire. I'm going to retire. I'm not going to do anything. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sitting at the farm talking to my mom and my dad, and the phone rings. It's Miller Brewing Company. They want to hire me to drink beer and have a good time. <laughs> I got done with that. Went back to the farm, sitting there again. The phone rings. Outdoor TV wants to hire me to uh, hunt and fish. End up in Alaska hunting and fishing. You have to have some patience doing this, don't you? Yeah. This would be good for you, Jim. See that one jumping on the far bank over there? Fish on. Lift him up a little bit. Nice job. All right, lift him just a little bit and bring him out. Got to pull your pole back a little bit, Jim. <laughs> Listen to you. You got one fish and you're coaching him. <laughs> oh, shoot. Let him run, let him run a little bit. Well, shut up, will you? <laughs> Mr. Outdoors and all That's it. That's it, pal. It's easy, Jim. Not real hard. Easy. Yeah. You caught a fish. Wow. <laughs> Look at that bad boy. Listen to Merc here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. I loved it. Hey, man. <laughs> I'm just glad we did this. 
Glad we lived this long to enjoy it. Yep. This is really cool. To this day, I see it differently than I saw it back then, because back then I saw it as what I did, and now I see it as what we did, as what Jim and Larry and I did, and that we have this relationship and this bond over this one specific thing that we did in professional sport like nobody else ever did. It took 45 years, got you here, both caught a fish, almost, I don't know, pretty equal, I don't know. Yeah, Jim said his was bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Not the fish, though. <laughs> you saw me catch my first fish, and you saw me make my first touchdown. Yeah, to be honest with you, the fish was much more exciting. <laughs>